Okay, great. Uh, hello and welcome everyone to our WFO monthly webinar. My name is Ilya Karnaluchov and I'm the Senior Development Manager at the World Forum Offshore Wind. Today's webinar is about current and future development challenges of offshore wind. My great pleasure to welcome our three excellent speakers for today. Uh, we have Stephen Wilson, the Director of Business Development at API Group. We have Masayuki Sugiyama, the General Manager at Mitsui OSK Lines. And we have Bernhard um, Stuvesant, the Head of Department Aerodynamics and Numerical Energy Meteorology at uh, Fraunhofer. So, and before I give the floor to our speakers for today, let me let me tell you a few things about WFO. The our organization was founded a bit over 10, three years ago, and we're a nonprofit entity focused exclusively on offshore with energy promotion. We have an international office set up uh, with offices in Hamburg, Tokyo, Taipei, and New York. And in terms of our activities, it's very straightforward um, as we focus on three things. We lobby for offshore wind around the world, we inform about offshore wind, and we connect the global offshore wind community by doing various events such as this one, for example. And in terms of our members, we're very happy to have over 75 global members from all segments of offshore wind value chain, representing North America, Europe, Asia, and even Australia. And if somehow you're still not a WFO member yet, please make sure to join us. Uh, and for that, you can either check information on our website or contact Gunnar Herzig, our managing director. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us anytime. And just a few, a few words about the structure of this webinar, which is actually very simple. During the first half of the webinar, um, Steven Bernhardt and Masayuki will present on the topic and during the second half of the event we're going to work um, with your questions, we'll have a discussion on the topic, so please feel free to submit your qu questions in the chat um, function on your control uh, panel, which is on the right hand side. And um, now without any further ado, um, Bernhardt, the floor is yours. Okay. Yes, I will present on um, method for, well, on challenges in post-construction analysis of, of offshore wind farm. I'm uh, part of the Fraunhofer EWIS, uh, Fraunhofer Institute for Wind Energy Systems. We are part of the Fraunhofer Society, so that's basically in Germany a society for applied research. So we develop things for certain uh, certain areas and our institute is focusing on wind energy. So we're a bit, to give you an idea of how this works is, uh, uh, well, there is of course basic research by universities. We are somewhere in between the industry and the universities because like one third of our funding has to come directly from the industry. So this enforces in a way that uh, all our research has to be somehow applicable by the industry. And um, so there are of course a lot of different branches within, within our institute. I will focus Currently now, just on one one thing, single thing, that is a post-construction and a, a yield assessment that we do. Um, uh, why do we do this? I mean, there is, of course, if you have a wind farm out there, uh, there is, of course, the pre-construction -construct site assessment, and you have that. And now, if you build your wind farm, uh, there are, of course, annual uh, variations of the wind. Uh, there are wake effects, downtimes, and all this curtailments maybe uh, and in the end you want to know uh, is my wind farm uh, actually performing in the way uh, uh, that it should have been was this a good performance or maybe not and this is of course very hard to say because all this varies all the years over all the years so in the end the questions that we get asked is like uh, you know what is the real value value for example of the wind farm um, is there possibly a bonus penalty uh, with a wind turbine manufacturer. Uh, yeah, what can be learned also for new uh, wind farms, um, also from the first month in operation. So actually, what's the, you know, we want to know what do I actually get out of the wind and uh, how much is my potential in the end? 
So um, to make this clear, on the right hand side, for example, you have or originally your uh, your site assessment and some kind of, assess of assessment of an expected annual energy production. Uh, and then you have some measured data, and uh, the question was, uh, is this actually as good as it was supposed to be? Or uh, maybe my, uh, my actual um, possible uh, revenue was, was different. And for that, what we do is, uh, well, we look at different things. Uh, there you have uh, SCADA data, of course. You have event logs, maintenance protocols. Numerical weather data uh, and um, if available uh, wind measurements. So typically what we'll do is we use the SCADA data and we look uh, and combine this with numerical wind uh, uh, wind forecasts and or, or not just forecasts, the array analysis data um, and we do a WARF, so mesoscale simulation. So we refine that reanalysis data to the local conditions and uh, if we have also, uh, we use uh, measurement data. Uh, what we do then is we actually, well, we use a time series approach for that. So we look at each, yeah, well, every 15 minutes, basically, it's mainly most of the time, uh, we look at uh, what is actually the wind all these 15 minutes, and then we uh, evaluate uh, the actual farm performance and the wake, wake effects within the farm. Uh, so basically, we model for each time step the real situation of the wind farm to analyze what is what does it actually look like, what was it like, and uh, what was it would it would have been it to be in theory uh, if we uh, look at all this. So basically, we have a wind assessment for each time step. We have a farm performance at each time step, and in the end, we compare this to the real data from the wind farm. And then there are differences, and of course, from these differences, we can say uh, we can analyze these events and say, okay, was this now good or not so good? So, uh, for example, in this time series down here, you can we can see um, a lot of curtailment events uh, on the right hand side uh, where the wind farm was curtailed uh, for this period of time. So, um, yeah, all this has to be taken into account. And the interesting part is then, of course, where do we have deviations? And our experience is that deviations mostly appear in uh, situations of uh, stable stratification. That is when the atmosphere in the upper part is warmer than the lower part. And uh, uh, this is typically in the northern hemisphere, more uh, in springtime, um, like especially like in German areas, that doesn't make quite a difference in the terms of the seasons. And um, well, uh, if we have that, then well, we well recognize often quite some differences, and there are typical effects that cause this. There might be global blockage or large scale effects of wind farms. Large scale wind farm effects are look like this. Uh, this is uh, on the right hand side. You can see the um, well, this the German Bight uh, called the North Sea, and some wind farm clusters and the wakes of the wind farm clusters. And you can see that these wakes under stable stratification can last quite a quite, quite long and uh, have quite an effect on the neighboring wind farms. And uh, the more wind farms you build, uh, um, for example, then uh, the more you will have these effects. For example, in the German bite, we can see over the years uh, how much effect this has over the overall uh, wind in terms of wind reductions. Um, so. Well, uh, of course, it's a numerical thing um, we do. Uh, so we validated this now in the so-called cross-wakes pro project um, uh, with uh, LiDAR data for different wind directions. On the right-hand side, you can see this wind rows um, uh, with wharf uh, and, and the wharf calculation with wind farms. So you can see there's a difference. Um, well, the great Dots here are wind turbines. So this is within um, measured on the edge of a wind farm cluster. And we can see some effects, uh, especially from the western winds uh, from these wind farm clusters, but also, of course, from this wind farm directly from the east. So by that, uh, overall, we get it from the model about a difference in about 2% in the wind speed um, to the real measured data, 
within this project. But uh, of course, there will be more offshore winds. Uh, we expect quite well. Our government is currently planning with a 70 gigawatts, and this is not just German bite. Like the uh, on the right hand side, you can see the plan. Uh, well, the prospected possible wind farm areas, uh, which are surrounded. These are German areas. The non-surrounded ones are Dutch wind farms, for example. So we, we also have cross-border effects. And you can see on the right hand side, like the scale um, of how much wind reduction we see. So this is all, in some areas, even up to more than 30% by that. So this needs to be, of course, to be taken into account. I skipped this for time reasons. Uh, of course, then there is global blockage also causes some effects uh, under stable stratification. So we develop models for that. And currently we implement this in our in-house tool Foxes. And um, this will be put open source pretty soon. Uh, we're just clarifying some legal stuff, and this will be available soon. So you can, we will be able to download it. So um, all of this uh, leads to a situation, uh, well, it's quite important to really look deeply into this, uh, what actually causes differences in your expectations. It's really worth it, I can say. Uh, our experience is, um, that uh, that it's worth for the those farm well, well owners that contacted us we did uh, work together quite a bit so that's uh, we got very positive feedback yeah but we really need to take into account all these different effects uh, well which are basically effects uh, of meteorology I would say so um, yeah so don't do only pre pre-site assessment, but also post-construction site assessment. It will help you with wind farms. That's it from my side. I hope I'm in time. OK. Yes, great. Thank you very much. Perfectly on time. It's my pleasure to welcome our second speaker for today, Masayuki Sugiyama. OK. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks the idea. Uh, uh, Masayuki Sugiyama is my name. Uh, I'm general manager in charge of the uh, wind power business in uh, Mitsurosuke Mine, we call MOL. So we appreciate for uh, giving us uh, this opportunity to show you our business activity in the offshore wind sector. So uh, I think, it, I guess you may not be uh, familiar with uh, our name, MOL. MOL is not a power company, but a shipping company. Today, uh, I want to talk about why the shipping company is getting involved in the offshore wind sectors. And uh, today's agenda here is uh, I want to talk about, about those three points. Uh, one, uh, first, MOL's company outline. And the second, why did the MOL want to be involved in the offshore wind? And the last one is MOL's actual activity in the offshore wind. So I mentioned, uh, yes, we are a shipping company, MOL. Uh, MOL is one of the largest shipping company in the world. The company has been focusing not only on a traditional marine transportation, but over the last 10 years, also developed the marine infra infrastructure business, such as uh, oil and gas offshore project. Uh, here, so uh, MOL Group Corporate Mission. It says, uh, uh, from the blue ocean, we sustain the people's lives and ensure the prosperous future. I like this phrase. So anyway, so MOL uh, aims to be a strong, resilient company, providing new value to the all stakeholders and growth uh, globally. Yes, here is our company outline. So we have uh, uh, over 130 years history. Uh, it's not a fixed rate at the moment. Uh, I, I cannot uh, I cannot mention here, but uh, uh, for the net profit for the fiscal year 2021, it's not close yet. But uh, estimation would be uh, net profit uh, would be uh, six billion USD. Uh, luckily, from the container market. Anyway, so we have a technical specialist, uh, also technical specialist, not only for the seamen, but also neighbor architect for the designing ships. 
<coughs> so uh, this is slide shows MOL's position among the world shipping industries. So we are in the second rank, just below the Chinese giant, the China Costco. But uh, why reason why we have uh, such a kind of the lead, such a large fleet, we have uh, all, we are uh, operating over the 800 vessel. <clears throat> so uh, we have a unique portfolio. So we have, uh, 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 um, how can I say, we are, multimodal shipping company. <clears throat> so all types of the vessel are into the portfolio and are operating in the respective market drive, such as driver cars and uh, conventional tankers and car carriers and gas carrier, including LNG and LPG. And another one is container ships. So anyway, so uh, this is a kind of <clears throat> unique uh, uh, business model for the shipping industry. Uh, that's why we have a big fleet. <clears throat> so next one, <clears throat> I want to talk about the reason for the expanding the business in the offshore wind. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> like uh, many companies around the world, uh, MOL is putting uh, importance on on the SDGs management, uh, especially as a shipping company. So we have to emit a huge amount of the uh, GHG. Uh, we are calculate on that maybe the amount is 15 million ton a year, very huge number. So I think the uh, GHG reduction from our business is big challenge to be sustainable company even in the 15 years later. Uh, recently, so MOL uh, established its global environment, um, environmental vision 2.1 last year, uh, pledging to the achieve net zero emission by 2050. So uh, in order to achieve this vision, the company has set out uh, five strategy here, uh, and is promoting business development that will contribute not only to the decarbonization of the company, but also decarbonization of society of the world. So uh, the business development for the uh, offshore wind sector is positioned with top priority of the company for our contribution of the decarbonization, decarbonization of the society. Then why offshore wind? <clears throat> so at the background, uh, we must recognize the sustainability uh, of the business model of the transporting the mass fossil fuel by using the fossil fuel, I mean the fuel oil. Uh, to be sustainable uh, 15 years from now, uh, we must decarbonize, decarbonize our fuel and change the, our business portfolio. Question is why should the shipping company tackle on the offshore wind? So first reason is a comp compatibility or affinity with our experience at the sea, more than 130 years. Um, MOL with its many seafarers and uh, other technical staff has grown on the strength of our technology in field of marine transportation and offshore infrastructures. Uh, those resources <clears throat> and experience uh, can be useful for the value chain of the offshore wind. Second one is, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the business portfolio to be, uh, need to be transformed from marine transportation. Third one is uh, 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 by being involved in the uh, entire value chain of the offshore wind, including uh, the power generation itself, MOL may be educated for the industry needs uh, or standard in the supply chain area where uh, MOL can be demonstrate its strengths. Finally, uh, it has the potential to contribute to indirectly to the decarbonization of the company, which is a big challenge for the MOL. Uh, by uh, Involving into the offshore wind sector, which is a center of the circle in the renewal business, uh, we can access value, valuable network uh, leading the decarbonization of society 
they may provide some resources for decarbonization of the company, it means that MOL. And uh, in particular, uh, I want to touch about the uh, offshore sol uh, floating solution. As a area, we can leverage uh, strengths of the shipping company. So first, uh, uh, relation with shipyard, uh, they are potential manufacturer of the floaters. Uh, MOL has been working with uh, them as a user of ships uh, or buyer of the ships. So we have worked to build uh, their products with better quality. Uh, in particular, uh, we may uh, contribute to, uh, uh, for the design of floaters to reduce the total life cost from the viewpoint of the user operating ships for 15 or 20 years. So, uh, second one is uh, <clears throat> our experience, uh, our expertise in the floating structures. Uh, we have uh, knowledge uh, to operate uh, offshore structure such as FSRU, floating storage regasification unit, and uh, that is called the LG, and FPSO, <coughs> uh, that is the floating, uh, floating production and the storage and the offloadings. <coughs> that is a kind of the type of the ships, but that not to be uh, navigation, in navigation. So uh, we may provide the insight of the O and M, uh, O and M, with uh, non-dry docking over 20 years without stopping operation. That is the point. The last point is uh, MOLs. Uh, here is uh, uh, some. Mm, some of the offshore wind value chain business MOL are involved in involved now or want to go in. In the supply chain areas uh, here in the uh, out of circle I mentioned, the first one is a transportation uh, for the windmill components or foundations. Then also we are involved in the wind turbine installation vessel. Uh, so we, uh, we invested and participated to the CJAX uh, in the UK. Uh, and uh, we experience in dealing with Japan's cabotage uh, regulation to bring uh, CJAX Zalatan. She's now uh, in the operation in Akita in the northern part of Japan. That is a uh, <coughs> uh, wind turbine vessel, a uh, wind turbine insulation vessel. That here is a, a cable layer He's here. Uh, although uh, there is a very limited number of the electric cable layer in the Far East area, but uh, we have been engaged in the operating the lay, uh, laying the communication cable for the more than 40 years, maybe. By such experience, uh, we are ready to build and operate new ships for laying the electric cable. Uh, here is uh, SOB. Uh, this is the Asian first SOB. Uh, she is not. Uh, she she was just delivered in the last week, and uh, uh, for the old old state uh, Taiwanese project, uh, she is now final preparation uh, work in Taiwan. Here is CTV crew transformation vessel. Uh, in Japanese market, particularly in the beginning stage, the CTV is the main solution for the uh, maintenance support ships. So we prepared a new design for this type of ships and are ready to build and operate. Finally, I want to, I have to mention about the, the center of circle. So which, may, uh, which say that the offshore wind hub de development. Uh, recently, uh, we just de decided to join the Taiwanese Hormosa One that is only one commercial project in the operation in Taiwan at this moment. So uh, we believe this knowledge and experience will contribute to feedback into our all uh, business in offshore wind value chain. Uh, this slide shows so, uh, 
uh, show that uh, we want to be, uh, we want to commit to the uh, every step of the value chain. That is our strategy for uh, offshore. So detail of the uh, uh, actual business uh, explained in the following page. I think this uh, slide uh, should be uh, shared after the uh, seminar. So, yeah, so please see it later. Uh, this is a, a recent co uh, company advertisement, so sorry in Japanese, but uh, uh, saying that is no the she uh, catch the wind. Again, I like this phrase. Anyway, so MOL would like to contribute to the uh, offshore wind sector by utilizing the knowledge of the shipping company. Okay, thank you very much. This is my presentation. Thank you very much, Masuki, for this very insightful presentation. And now I'm glad to introduce our final speaker for tonight, Stephen Wilson. Stephen, over to you. Good afternoon to most of you, uh, and maybe good morning to a few of you. Um, so, yeah, I'm happy to give you a little insight into how we've been uh, localizing our growth across the, the new wind energy markets. So just a little bit picking up on um, our previous um, uh, presenter there, uh, EPI uh, reached the accolade of certified carbon neutral company um, at the beginning of last year. What does that mean? Well, we most of the carbon that we generate as a company is through our own staff, the travel of those staff, and we provide consultants to various different parts of the energy sector. And all of the travel that uh, um, generates carbon for those for those people traveling, EPI pays to offset that carbon out of its own profits. And we expect that at some point in the future, this will become a very important part of uh, the assessment of suppliers for projects to try and minimize the carbon that we use in uh, everyday projects. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about um, uh, transitioning and uh, bringing people from one industry to another. Um, not surprising, we've talked about the hydrocarbons industry being a source of uh, people and expertise for the renewable energy industry, and EPI is amongst those companies that's uh, successfully transitioned between the two industries. So we started back in about 2014, and we're now working across all these different markets, including carbon capture, geothermal and obviously offshore wind which we're going to talk to you in more detail today so what do we do as a company we provide technical expertise across the geoscience area and environmental areas in-house we have a depth of knowledge within our small team we're only a company of about 30 people but we provide access to over two and a half thousand consultants from over 70 countries around the world but with that depth of knowledge in-house so that when you have our people on your project you know you've got people that will back them up and can resolve any issues and also can advise you on some of the challenges of um, uh, starting new projects and new project teams in new countries we're spread out across the world i'm based in the uk and i'll explain to you my, about my colleagues in uh, apac and us and we have a number of different branches uh, globally as well to enable us to work there including taiwan um, and I'm sure any company that's worked in Taiwan will know why you need a Taiwanese office. So as I said, we're spread out all over the world of our projects. And uh, last year we reached the amazing accolade of over 4 million man hours without a lost time incident for a small company that's running over two and a half thousand consultants worldwide to maintain our health and safety at that level, level is extremely important to us. And we've achieved all of the necessary ISO accreditations and business accreditations that you would expect to be able to operate successfully in all these different markets that we work in. So in offshore wind, um, these are the sort of key services that we provide. So to the developers, we're providing uh, client reps for geophysical and geotechnical survey. We have a number of different services across the UXO risk management and also representatives on board the vessels. Um, we've brought successfully uh, our knowledge of uh, seismic data and design for surveys from the hydrocarbon sector into the renewable sector now. And there's a huge demand for um, protective species observers, particularly in the US market that we are, we are set, um, um, servicing. And we provide acoustic monitoring during operations as well. And again, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. But what's key here is that we maximize local content. Um, as a carbon neutral company, um, we are offsetting all of the uh, travel of all of the consultants. Um, 
during COVID, we were successfully able to provide consultants in Taiwan and other places when there was a complete lockdown and restrictions on travel. We were able to get local people with the relevant uh, transferable knowledge into those wind farms, which gives you the best value. Um, and we can put people inside your company as well to complement your team. Um, particularly in some of these new areas where we've got new teams, new offices being set up all over the world, and they don't necessarily have access to the depth of knowledge required to run their projects. So developing local content. Um, some wind farms uh, or some locations where wind farms have been built, there is a requirement to uh, maximize as much as possible the supply chain locally, and that includes um, people. So we've been looking at where we can adapt um, existing skills from hydrocarbons particularly, uh, but where we, ha we do have to look at what the gaps are and how we meet the wind standards, particularly in health and safety. Uh, and that, that goes when you go into new countries as well, they're not used to the wind standards and we need to um, educate the people uh, locally that these are what's required and there's a good reason for that because you know, we've got a long track record across the world of building wind farms safely. Um, th there's a real challenge in uh, making sure that we can buddy people up with experienced wind people. Uh, otherwise, we'll never grow any local content anywhere if we just demand the same people to move from the European to America <laughs> to Asia. Um, you're never going to grow the market. So we do talk to the uh, developers and make sure that they understand what the requirements are to support us in doing that. And, and we need to gain their approval to do that as well. Um, a lot of the big survey contractors, because we're mainly working in survey and uh, supporting um, some of the construction companies, but in survey, uh, a lot of the big vessels, the DP2 vessels, are being brought from outside of these new markets. Uh, they're predominantly English-speaking teams on board, um, but their supply requires them to be supported by smaller vessels, which often are local, to increase local content, and obviously do not have the same language necessarily. And that's an area where we've been really successful, able to have um, uh, experienced people speaking English with new local content, giving them the skills, but also them providing with um, the, the language uh, in order to be able to uh, successfully manage the team. And the other thing about uh, having local content is there's a lot of times we need to find people very quickly. And uh, that immediacy of the requirement is very difficult when you've got to get people in and out of countries Obviously, with the COVID restrictions we've had, that makes it even worse. And, you know, there's sometimes uh, competing adjacent projects and adjacent markets as well that we have to deal with in this. So transitioning the skills. So, yeah, I talked a little bit about uh, um, hydrocarbons and how we can bring people from hydrocarbons into uh, the wind industry. But it's not quite as simple as that, as I'm sure many of you will know. Um, although, yeah, the skill sets are very similar. Um, in geophysical, for instance, there's a number of areas, particularly around how we quality assure and quality control the data while it's being collected, that are a little bit different in wind. There, we're seeing more and more developers asking us to make sure that um, the, the client representative can not only oversee the actual um, acquisition process, but can look at the data and confirm that the data is of the acquired quality in order for them to be sure to off um, uh, uh, off hire that vessel and not have to go back out there and take more uh, data at a later date. Seismic is being used more and more in the wind sector, and that's a big strength from the hydrocarbon industry. Seismic data has been used for many, many years. It's an area of deep knowledge as well within um, EPI. Again, health and safety is a very strong discipline, but you can't just take somebody straight off a boat in the hydrocarbon industry and put them into offshore wind because there's a whole number of um, sort of wind passport certificates required in order to be able to get onto a wind farm, okay? Um, and then there's the cultures uh, and, and objectives. So, you know, oil and wind are very different from a, a, a fuel point of view. Um, and, you know, obviously the oil and gas people may have been working for 20, 30 years in the industry, but the wind guys do have a very strong knowledge of what they want to achieve and how they want to do it as well. So we do see some cultural clashes and those things need to be managed. In the geotechnical area, it's very different. You know, we're, we're talking now about wind farm owners being interested in the top 50 meters of soil and um, the oil and gas sector are interested in the top four kilometers <laughs> of material. And they're looking obviously for where their um, deposit might be and how they might access that. Um, so the, 
the techniques that they go about um, interrogating the, the uh, um, soil subsea are different. Um, the transition is possible, but it does require um, experience of the wind specific techniques and uh, equipment that's been used there. And, and there is a lot of that experience out there that hasn't necessarily been used in wind. But again, you've got to be very careful when you're looking for a geotechnical person to go offshore for wind. It is a different set of skills and equipment that they'll be using and therefore that needs to be taken into um, consideration. And, and again, on, on both areas here, um, we do need to be aware of the, the the challenges of working across two different markets. We often don't get people committed to one or the other. They like to uh, use go in one market and then back in the other. And the problem is hydrocarbon rates can vary up and down very quickly. Wind rates are a lot more stable uh, and there's a lot more work as well. It's, um, it is seasonal, but there is a lot of work going on throughout the year. Um, but yeah, it is quite challenging if... Um, the price of fuel goes up very high, then that means a lot more um, hydrocarbon projects are going to get uh, sanctioned in the next few years if that maintains that very, very high rate. Protected species observers, what is this all about? So um, particularly in the US market, uh, there are a number of species uh, of mammal uh, and birds as well that need to be protected from the um, construction and also some of the survey activities that are taking place on the wind farm. Um, it's very tightly regulated. Uh, it does differ from country to country. And, um, um, you know, we are looking now, so we've developed our own uh, training course uh, uh, over the last year, and that's just been approved by BOEM and NIMFS in the US. Um, that going on the training course does cover you specifically for offshore wind construction, but also it covers you for all of the hydrocarbon industry activity as well. And uh, we've already got the approved trainers in place. So we're actually running our first uh, uh, training course uh, over the next week, and then we'll open it up to the rest of the market. We're just doing the test on our um, guinea pigs. The key thing for us about this, though, has been uh, actually approaching people local to each project, uh, looking for people of a specific background, inviting them, asking them if they would like to come work for us on wind farm projects, um, helping them with some of the cost barriers, because obviously it's not just this course, which is relatively cheap compared to the number of different certificates they need to get and the different training courses they need to go on before they've got all of the um, uh, relative, relative relevant certifications to be able to go offshore and also i don't know if you know about this but in the u.s market the the minority uh, groups are being prioritized through the procurement process and we can help in that in approaching some of the local tribes within the different uh, states and uh, anybody who's been involved with either marine biology or got a strong university level biology um, background can actually go on this course and uh, qualify to be a protected species observer. Um, we're also uh, continuously monitoring the sound as well, made by the vessel, made by the geotechnical campaign, made by the construction of putting piles into the seabed, and also these lovely animals that are out in the sea, so that if we, if we hear them coming, we can uh, quickly uh, address that and either slow things down or stop completely if we need to uh, avoid any kind of incident. So again, um, so our new markets, obviously, I've talked quite a bit about the US, but actually um, we've been quite successful over the last two years in Taiwan. And we're just making uh, our first sort of moves into uh, Korea and Japan, where a lot of survey activities, both geophysical and geotechnical, are about to take place. And we have local people uh, to your projects. So uh, uh, Chong, who's the general manager and has been with us for a couple of years, he's ex Fugro. Uh, very, very strong, experienced technical background in geotechnical and geophysical, um, located locally in Malaysia and has been popping in and out of Taiwan, Japan and Korea over the last couple of years when he could. Um, and he's already developed an experienced pool of over 20 offshore consultants in that time working on the different wind farms who are becoming extremely in demand across the many projects that are now going ahead. Um, in March, we just took on Mark O oh as our new regional BD manager based in South Korea. Um, there's a lot of floating wind projects coming up in South Korea, a lot of survey activities. Mark is very knowledgeable uh, with a, a background in the subsea cable side of things, and he's been working with the local developers with ourselves and other companies previously, and so should be a good member to the team. 
so these guys are there for the customers who are based locally uh, but they're also there for our consultants to develop the pool from this 20 to 50 over the next uh, year or two so that we continue to expand and have more and more people available um, locally so number of customers names you would expect if we've been working heavily in the us and asia these are across many wind farms that we've been involved and also some of the um, uxo uh, projects that we've been involved in working on as well and uh, long may it grow this list so i've got some contact details for you myself i'm based in the uk and liaise with our european clients Chong, obviously you've met in the previous slide, is based in Kuala Lumpur, and these two guys are in the US, and we're more than happy to hear from you in the future. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Stephen, for your excellent presentation and a great overview. So we have uh, some time left, approximately 15 minutes. And uh, we may begin with um, with a general question to to all of you. So, what are the most uh, pressing development challenges and risks in the offshore wind industry? <clears throat> so, maybe Stephen, if you go first, then Masayuki, and then uh, Bernhard. Well, pe people. <laughs> so, right now, we're seeing a number of new companies set up all over the world and getting access to experienced people either from the industry or from adjacent industries is a is a big problem um, the number of new developments we've got coming in the us korea philippines japan um, it, it's just going to put a bigger and a bigger constraint on um, getting access to their people so we we're very flexible we're, we're trying to bring people through as you saw in the presentation but also um, we can provide part-time access to people as well in-house to try and deal with this but yeah people is going to be a big challenge over the coming years. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Masayuki, what's your view? What are the most pressing development challenges and risks in the offshore wind industry? Um, I, I think I, I cannot hear you at the moment. Hey, sorry for that. Yeah, uh, in case of the Asian market, uh, including Japan, but except China, so uh, this is a very, very initial stage for the offshore wind industry in, in this market. So, but the standard or uh, benchmark is now uh, establishing in the uh, European side. I think this, so that, uh, I think that we should introduce the European standard to the Asian market, but sometimes a different, we have different culture to the safety standard, something like that. So I think the, uh, smooth in installation uh, for the knowledge or experience from the European company to the Asian market is very uh, not the easy task or maybe challenge. So I think the, that is the point to 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 develop or success for the Asian market. I think that is my, my opinion. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Bernhard. What's your view? Well, there are, of course, a, a lot of uh, real challenges and risks um, from, uh, yeah, we are, we are mainly looking at this wind risk because this uh, reduction in, uh, in wind due to surrounding wind farms that are being erected is, of course, something that uh, is a risk to the, uh, well, to the, to the investors and thus to trust in wind energy projects. And this is, of course, uh, quite a risk for for future projects. So, uh, a good estimation of what's actually going to happen around around my wind farm, not just my wind farm, but all around, is uh, is uh, some some risk to really look at, and uh, it's a challenge we have to face. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, another question is. Um, just a few days ago, oil prices hit 14 years old record, and some experts say uh, prices might increase even further. Do you foresee it affecting offshore wind development, both across the world and in your specific country? If so, in which ways and what kind of implications it might have? So maybe uh, Masayuki this time first, then Bernhard, and then Steven. 
Yes. What did you say? That what kind of a price is now? Uh, oil. So oil prices oh, oil right price. now. Oil price. Yes. Right. Yes. So do you uh, think do, do you yeah. think it may have any effect? <laughs> yes, I think the uh, in Japan uh, we our our how can I say uh, portion for the renewable energy is very limited. Maybe I think below twenty percent right now. Maybe 15, 20, 12, something like that. So that's why. So we, uh, uh, Japan's uh, government is now targeting to develop the wind offshore wind project. Uh, they are targeting to to the uh, 30 to 40 gigawatt at 2040. That means uh, I think the oil price uh, crisis, uh, maybe, or well, I mean the price. Uh, uh, increasing is a good news for the renewable, but uh, I think for the a stable uh, uh, economic growth for the Japan. I uh, think the uh, it's not good for such a uh, very high oil price. Right? Maybe it, it's a good thing to the renewable side, but uh, sometimes bad news for the renewable because the uh, uh, company or private company uh, have to invest a huge money for the uh, energy companies, particularly uh, have to invest. Uh, to the renewable side, but uh, before that, so uh, they are uh, they may face to the difficulty to buy the uh, uh, oil price. That's my opinion. Thank you. Okay, Masuki, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Bernhard, what's your view? Yeah, I I do agree. I think uh, uh, in the long run, of course, it's it's good for wind energy for offshore wind energy. Uh, as well because uh, of course it is the cheaper uh, alternative in the end but for in the short term uh, it means uh, larger investments so uh, everything's going to be more expensive and it's not just oil it's also steel because the coal will all is also increasing in price so it's uh yeah it's uh, we are having quite a challenge there in terms that well uh, the cost of in the of the investments are, are going to be bigger now Okay, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. So um, I own an electric car, and we need to go electric. Um, we need to use hydrogen more. This is a fantastic opportunity for everyone to realize how reliant they are on um, uh, petrol at the petrol station and the price they're having to pay. And there's no need for that. You know, we need to move quickly. Yes, it is going to cause a short-term short problem um, because costs are going to go up. But these industries need to move away from the use of um, oil and gas. It's absolutely clear now, and it's the best advertisement for offshore wind and to invest more in offshore wind. I believe the government's job is to actually uh, penalise the use of oil and gas and uh, get us moving more quickly towards alternative um, low carbon fuels like wind. OK, great. Thank you very much for sharing views. So the next question is again for all of you, and that's um, about floating offshore wind. So if you have knowledge um, regarding that, so what uh, what's your view on the most prominent floating wind offshore wind development challenges or opportunities again globally and in your countries? And um, maybe Bernhard first, then Steven and Masayuki. Okay. Um, well, the German waters are rather uh, not so deep. Uh, so uh, it's not so obvious to go floating there, uh, but there might be actually some use cases where it might be necessary to use floating uh, turbines. I think this uh, uh, basically we're tackling currently the tech uh, technological challenges there. Uh, there is quite still some research to be done, but uh, in general, uh, there will be a lot of areas where it will be necessary and I think it will pay off in the end. So I think it's a great opportunity to go into and in, in invest into this because uh, uh, we will see uh, reduced prices in terms of the uh, for the investments and I think it will pay off. So it's, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's, I would, uh, 10 years ago, I would have said it's almost uh, no, no way. Uh, this is way too expensive and too much material, material and all this. But I don't think so anymore. I think this is a real good opportunity to go for that. Okay, great. Thank you. Steven? So, yeah, it's really exciting, actually. Um, 
because we've been working in Korea, I've, I've realized that there's a really good match between the local supply chain, the ability to do cost-effective manufacturing of large sea structures. But obviously, they've been building vessels for many years in Korea uh, and very successfully as well. And their wind and their depth of water and the companies that have moved in to support them, um, just a fantastic sort of marrying of all those different things in one place. So um, I, I think, yes, UK, um, Japan, others are all all got small projects, but I, I can see Korea getting floating wind right first um, and really excited to be part of that as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Masayuki? Thank you. Uh, yes, I agree with, uh, uh, with the two guys. Uh, I think the floating solution is uh, in the case of Japan, so we have a limited uh, sea uh, uh, appropriate, appropriate for the bottom of this type. Mm -hmm. The very uh, sea depth uh, is a, a very limited uh, area for the reasons very uh, shallow depths. Uh, uh, appropriate for the bottom mix type. So that means uh, I think to be, uh, uh, so if we, if we go to the achieving, achieving to the uh, uh, government target, target, that is a very huge number of the uh, capacity for the floating wind. So that means that uh, we should have the floating solution uh, in the Japan area. Uh, as Stefan said, so uh, Korea is also and uh, maybe China is making uh, is, is going to be such kind of the market. But, but in the case for Asian, it's, uh, particularly Far East, we have a very good industry for the shipbuilding side and also shipping itself. So that uh, we can uh, contribute, our industry contribute to, in the, uh, uh, to develop the floating solution in a uh, floating sector uh, in cooperation with the European uh, front runners. That's uh, my opinion. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and then the following question is what's the offshore with industry could learn from other industries uh, based on your uh, expertise and your opinion? So maybe this time uh, Stephen first, then Masayuki, and then Bernhard. Gosh, what hasn't offshore wind learned from other industries? I was just trying to think, is there anything new? Um, yeah. You know, there's been so much development going on. Um, I think uh, the, the government in sort of early on in, in the different projects, like floating wind needs some level of um, uh, government encouragement, support and things. And, and and I don't think offshore wind can really learn it from other industries. I think offshore wind has demonstrated that it's got a really good grip on how to lobby governments and to make sure the right policies are in place. There's still a number of uh, countries that haven't started offshore wind yet. And I think I'm really interested to see who's next. Philippines, it was a few weeks ago with Triconti getting uh, big projects bought out by Iberdrola. Um, yeah. It, I don't think offshore wind has got much more to learn from other industries. I think it just needs to do its thing now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Masayuki? Uh, I agree with Stefan. So, uh, it's particularly in Asian area, it's a very new. Uh, it's very new for the every industry. I think the, uh, so we have to learn about a lot. Uh, even in the uh, offshore, inside the offshore, offshore industry, uh, offshore wind industry, particularly from the European side, I think the, it's not the stage for uh, the Asian players to educate outside the industry. I think. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And Bernhard, it's, it's hard to to add something. I think, uh, yeah, basically, uh, of course. The, the industry can learn from from uh, how how to well get their interest through at the governments of course uh, but uh, I, my my experience is already it's uh, the offshore wind energy industry at least in Germany is quite mature already on that so it's uh, uh, yeah it's uh, yeah it has has now grown to a point where it has its own issues and has to tackle them but I think it's uh, yeah, 
it's already quite mature. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and then we have um, a few more technical questions. So this time I wanna sign the order that just if you have some information and you can uh, answer. And the first question is, when do you expect to see some supply chain restrictions considering decarbonization requirements for the supply chain, such as SBTI scope three? So uh, if you have information regarding that, please uh, let us know. Mm. Uh, me, not yet, no. Okay, Steven, was it okay? Well, yeah, yeah I have I, better knowledge for that uh, regulation. So I mentioned at the beginning that EPI is a carbon neutral company. We've had one company ask us to show them that it's that that's what we do. So you know, it's a huge accolade for a small company like us to achieve that. But actually, yeah, the new regulations don't and new thinking doesn't happen very fast. Um, I guess because they don't want to um uh, penalize uh the, the whole of the supply chain because they haven't got their act together yet but we've done it so i, I don't see why other companies can't do it too mm -hmm. okay perfect another question also a more technical uh and maybe bernhardt since you already mentioned mm -hmm. about shallow waters maybe you can try to answer that question and the question is what makes the shallow depth of offshore wind more difficult than oil gas in geotechnical well the um in terms of geotechnical questions that's of course uh the surveying is uh well the mainly the surveying has been uh developed for oil gas uh uh for large depth and uh here we need information uh quite to the surface close to the surface and uh we need very detailed information for example on boulders and uh, things that are uh, some somewhere near, near the surface and uh, much smaller and uh, this is quite quite different so uh, actually there is a department at Fraunhofer Evers who specialized in this uh, and is still developing also further de uh, methods for more detailed information yeah but uh, it's not directly my field but uh, I know this is really special and this is quite different from oil gas in terms of the um, uh, technology that needs to be used there. Yeah, it's it's all about managing a different set of risks. So um, w when you develop a wind farm, um, if you're placing the foundation into the seabed, um, so like a monopile, then you actually test the seabed exactly where you're gonna place the wind turbine. And based upon that analysis, you determine how deep the wind turbine needs to be um, piled into the sea floor. Um, so that's one thing and that's that's a relatively low risk because obviously you know what the details of that um, location are the higher risk stuff are with boulders and changes in seabed conditions is cable routes so you choose your cable route based upon uh, the the uh, the symmetry of the seabed and also the materials of that seabed as well to try and find the the, the path of least resistance to get the cable in but actually you're only taking samples every uh, one one and a half kilometers and therefore you're making some assumptions about what it's gonna be like, and there could be hazards or changes in materials that affect the burial method and the laying of the cable, which can cause problems in either the lay process or the burial process that then become a cost problem to the client. So um, yes, you do you do see that in uh, pipe, pipeline um, uh, and laying in oil and gas, but if you're looking at, um, a cavity that contains oil or gas two or three kilometers under the ground and you're the geotechnical person for that it's very different to um, taking geotechnical samples along a cable route uh, compared to that yeah actually okay. we are we're like actually we are doing this with seismic methods so we don't only uh, like the probing is not uh, necessary anymore if you do it uh, unless you are you're obliged to but uh, yeah, uh, you can do this also with uh, shallow water, shallow seismic methods, also with very high accuracy. But this is, of course, uh, quite a technological challenge. Yeah, and that that is definitely but that's something that's coming from oil and gas, isn't it? The high, ultra high resolution seismic yes. surveys is something we we're very much involved bringing people from hydrocarbons and 
into that area as well. Yeah, but oil, oil and gas is focusing on deeper areas, and now we need the shallow areas of the uh, of yeah. where, where where the wind turbines need it. So that's okay. Okay, great, perfect. Thank you very much. So um, that's already brings us to the end of the webinar. And unfortunately, we still have technical questions, general questions, but it's already 2 p.m. So thank you very much for all of your answers and sharing your views today. Thank you very much, audience, for joining us. Uh, please join us next month as well. Uh, the following web webinar will be held uh, in uh, April, on April 20th, at the same time. And the topic will be offshore wind market updates. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.